In a previous episode, I discussed how the Bible helped me become a first generation cash flow millionaire. So therefore, in this episode, I'm gonna share how the Bible not only helped me, but more importantly, can help you become that type of person in a minimum time frame. In this episode of the Seven Figure Squad happening in three, two, one, let's go. What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Sapala here, hailing to you from the Money Smart Home Office here in uh, Chicago, Illinois, and I'm excited for this episode. Listen, you asked for this. You asked for this week in, week out. Matt, can I have more biblical baller breakdown Bible studies uh, uh, from, from, from how your perspective is as an entrepreneur? Again, I want to disclose, I'm not a pastor. Uh, I'm not a priest. I'm not a, I'm not a minister. I'm just an entrepreneur. I'm just a lay person in a church just looking at scripture, trying to figure out life to see what God has in store for me and unlocking that potential for his kingdom, for his glory, so therefore I can become what he created me to be. And if that means that you are benefiting from it too as we journey on this thing together, well, amen, brother and sister. So let's get right into it. How do you get to become a first generation cash flow millionaire, number one, and then number two, do it in minimum time to maximize success in a shorter time frame than normal. Let's do some quick math. According to Motley Fool, the average income in America is approximately $62,000 a year. Now, assuming that you didn't have any expenses, assuming that you just tucked all that money away and earned zero interest, it'd take you approximately 16 years to accumulate $1 million. Now, on the flip side, the last six years, let's say my wife and I have earned $1 million the last six years. Well, praise the Lord. Six million dollars in six years. Again, six million dollars in six years. So, what would you rather do? Would you rather take 16 years on average making sixty-two thousand dollars a year to make one million dollars? Assume you had no expense if you just took that money away, earning no interest. Or would you rather apply the same time, attention, and talent to earning six million dollars over six years, not sixteen? What would you rather have? I think it's obvious. You'd rather have the six million dollars. Not necessarily for you to materialize and have it to, to have you uh, roll around in your money and to sleep with it and to fall in love with your material success, but to be a blessing to other people as we have in our company to create jobs. Uh, I think last year the number was $13 million we paid out to our guys last year. A lot of them didn't depend on a COVID check. A lot of them didn't depend on uh, a stimulus check. A lot of them were dependent upon themselves and obviously their faith to get ahead and they had so much more confidence and control in their lives and not living a chaotic 2020 pandemic, just like opposite many other family and friends had because they incorporated some of the principles we're talking about today. In preparation for this episode, I bought out a couple books to help me reference this. And this is a, just a summary of my books here that I used as, as accelerants to my life. And I'm gonna reference a book here on top, which is one of my favorite books by Stephen K. Scott called The Richest Man Who Ever Lived. He also had another book here called The Greatest Man Who Ever Lived, which is another video, but I'm just gonna reference this one book here, recommended reading for those of you that want to maximize your secrets to success, wealth, happiness, and prosperity according to God's word. So let me cut right to it. What did the Bible do to help me become a first generation cash flow millionaire sooner than later? It's one word, counsel, partnership. So before we get into it, let's discuss what a definition of a partner or counselor is. Oftentimes people think of a partner as a legal partner or your wife, your better half, or some that you're in business with. But the better definition here is not necessarily a partner, but more importantly, counselor. Because on the other hand, in the definition is this. A counselor can mean anyone who gives us needed advice, consultation, direction, or aid in the pursuit of a particular goal. From the book, The Richest Man Who Ever Lived, Stephen K. Scott. So sometimes people think that it's just somebody that uh, you see here and there and off and on, whatever the case may be. Listen, in my life, my best partners have been people that have been in and out, day-to-day conversations, week-to-week conversations. Uh, we may not talk uh, 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 for, a couple, uh, for a couple days, three days, but there's not going to be a time of period where we don't feel like we're in connection, whether you're text message or dropping comments on social media or in a conversation, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. We're always in times of counsel and, and, and seeking advice. Now, the premise of this conversation is how to find and work with and partner with and involve the right people in your life to be that wise counselor, to be that type of person you can partner with. Well, King Solomon wrote the book Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, in the Bible. He is the son of King David. Many may know the, uh, the story about King David by the story of David and Goliath, the little shepherd boy taking out the big, 
uh, the big giant called uh, Goliath. And David had a son. His son is named Solomon. At a very young age, uh, God was asking, okay, Solomon, you're now going to be new, the new king. You're going to be the new king now. What are you going to do? What do you want? What do you want? Do you want riches? Do you want lands? Do you, do you, want, do you, want, uh, um, do you want armies? All these different things. Anything that he would, God was actually asking Solomon these type of questions. You know what Solomon asked? Very mature answer. Very mature answer. Very mature answer. He said, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom so therefore I can learn to lead your people. The Lord says, man, goodness gracious, I can't believe what a wise answer this kid gave me. He says, not only am I going to give you wisdom, but everything that you didn't ask for. One of the conversations we have here is what Solomon's purpose was to talk about wise counsel. Because in Proverbs 15, verse 22, he says this. He says, plants fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. And also Proverbs 11, verse 14, he also says this. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. So as you're planning off 2021, if you're planning off your new year, planning off a new endeavor, who's in your corner? Oftentimes, people do the typical dude move, at least I did. I did a typical dude move, says, I can do this, be myself and I. How many times have you heard that saying, if you want it done right, do it yourself? I don't know about that. Because you're putting yourself in a position of isolation. People say, well, I'm just going to be a good person. I'm just going to have the right intentions. Okay, you may have, but you're in a position of isolation. You're not putting the right people in your corner. You're not invoking counsel to help you close and, and help you understand there's going to be mistakes that you're about to make, and you can avoid all the mistakes, and more importantly, you can save yourself a lot of money and time by avoiding these mistakes if you just seek and invoke counsel. And the thing is here, number three, if you do decide to not use counsel, if you do decide to be isolated, guess what? You're going to be broke, you're going to be alone, and you're going to be ashamed. Let's reference this Proverbs, Proverbs 13, verse 18. He who ignores discipline comes to poverty and shame, but whoever heeds correction is honored. Think about that. He who heeds correction, he who enjoys and embraces discipline. Oftentimes people don't want to seek counsel. You know why? Because you are avoiding the truth. You're avoiding the fact that you've got to change. You're avoiding the fact that, hey, man, something that's gone wrong in your life, that you've been declaration, declaration, declaration after a declaration, and nothing has changed in life. You know why? Because probably you're not listening to counsel. Probably because you think you can do it yourself. You're isolated. Me, myself, and I, I can do it. But the Bible says, Proverbs says, hey, you got to invoke counsel. You got to have people around you to guide you and help you along the way. Which leads us to number four. If you're going to make plans... Seek advice. Are you sure, Matt? Are you sure? Let's take a look at this proverb. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 18. It says here, make plans by seeking advice. If you wage war, obtain guidance. Now, I know we're not going to war, war, but you're going on war in debt. Yes? You're going to war on, on poverty. Yes? You're going to war on living paycheck to paycheck. You're going to go to work on breaking generational curses, financial curses that have been operating and existing in your life. Yes? Well, if you're going to wage war on that, guess what? You probably need to seek advice. And to add to that, let's go to another proverb here. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6. It reads like this. It says, a wise man has great power, and a man of knowledge increases strength. So let me ask you a question. Do you want to be a wise man, wise woman? Do you want to be a person who has knowledge that increases your strength over time? Well, guess what? Next, next verse here, number six. For waging war, you need guidance. And for victory, many advisors. Not advisor. It definitely didn't say look in the man in the mirror. It said you need to seek advisors. I'm going to the next verse, which is verse seven. It says, wisdom is too high for a fool. In the assembly at the gate, he has nothing to say. So here's another thing too as well. Seek counselors but avoid the fool. If you just do a simple Google search on what a fool is, it's a person who is imprudent and unwise. It's opposite of a counselor. It's the opposite of advisor. The fool is who you need to avoid. Now here's another point. According to Proverbs, it talks about your associations, it talks about your friends, it talks about your advisors. Check, check, check out these many different ways that Proverbs, through King Solomon's writings in Proverbs, talks about these people. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. It says, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Who are you walking with? 
There's a saying there, show me your friends, I'll show you who you are. Is the people that you're around, are they wise? Are they adding to you? Or more importantly, are they taking from you? There's always going to be a war between the makers and the takers. Are you sitting around and hanging around and walking around with takers? Or are you sitting around, hanging around and walking with makers? The choice, again, is yours. Actually, let's go to another book that King Solomon wrote, which is called Ecclesiastes, which is the book after Proverbs. So let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. And it reads like this. Two are better than one. You see? Two are better than one, especially more than just yourself. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Why? Because if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. What type of friends do you have? Are they fair weather friends? Listen, back in the day when I used to go to the clubs all the time, I used to hang out at the lounges, I had my friends from Thursday to Sunday. Hey guys, please don't judge me. Okay, I'm just, I'm just sharing with you my mistakes. Please do not judge. I told you I wasn't a pastor. I told you I wasn't a minister. I'm just a kid born in a neighborhood just trying to figure out life. And I'm reading this stuff. I'm just sharing and passing on through you through the, through the power of social media and through video. But think about this real quick. For all of you that had the club days, for all the people that had the lounge days, for people that you may have had outside your life in the Lord, how many of you guys remember all the people that you partied with? Do you still remember them today? How many do you really hang with? How many would you really call your friends? How many are really trusted advisors in your life? I mean, if you called them right now to go in business with them, would they give you some money to go in business with you? Would they be your customer? Would they say, hey, man, you're going to go in business? You're going to open up a shop? You're going to open up a store? You're going to open up this type of restaurant? You're going to fight through this pandemic? You need some money? Here's $20,000. Do they got you like that? Or are they going to give you some business? They're going to throw some promotion support your way. Do you have a friend like that? Or are they doubting you? Are they downing you? Are they actually pulling back? Are they taking from you? you got to evaluate that. And by the way, the reason why people don't like this type of stuff because they realize for a good majority of their life, they've been hanging around the wrong people and they are afraid to make a change in their life. I'm probably just using this video right now to remind you that there's something powerful and purposeful in your life, but you need some counsel. You need the right advice. You need the right people around you to get to the type of life that God created for you to be. And it's not getting there because you got the wrong people, the wrong advice. You got the wrong friends around you. Let's go to another book, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 12. It reads like this. Through one, many may be overpowered, but two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, many of you that may have been to many weddings, you probably heard this, but I'm thinking about a rope, right? I'm thinking about a rope that weaves together. If two strands are together, you can pull it, pull it, pull it, and it probably most likely snap. But if you enter a third weave in there, one, two, three, you're weaving this thing, now it becomes a thicker rope, it's harder to split and pull apart. That's what a cord of three strands means. Who are you weaving your life with? Who are you hanging around? Who are you associating? Who are you putting your head in your heart to make decisions with, especially if it pertains to money? Before I jump into the last point, let me share with you a personal story that happened to me. In my desire, in my ambition to spread the brand of my company, to spread the brand of my business, I was getting marketing opportunities, I was getting PR opportunities, and instead of looking at the totality, the whole entire picture, or more importantly, seeking wise counsel, I decided to partner with this person to do promotions, to do marketing and advertising and, and just being online and being on the radio waves here in the city of Chicago. Make a long story short, I had nothing to do with this person's business. However, back to this point here of show me your friends, come to find this guy is one of the biggest scam artists. He not only scammed myself long term, but he scammed a lot of people before me and people were asking me, why are you hanging around with that guy? I'm like, well, he seems like a pretty good guy. Why? Tell me more. Tell me more. What did he do? Like, just tell, like, tell me more. Give me some tangible, concrete evidence of how he's taken advantage of you. And they showed it to me. They showed it to me. They showed it to me. And I tell you what, in the back of my mind, I said, you know what? In spite of what this guy is going through, um, let me give this guy a mental second chance. And uh, this guy's probably not going to bite me. He's probably, it's probably not going to hurt me. Anyway, I was staying on this promotion, this marketing campaign for, for at least six months. I think it was seven months or eight months, somewhere, somewhere around there. And make a long story short, he started getting a lot of damage. He started getting a lot of negative phone calls. And guess who got the collateral damage? Me. And the irony is, I was seen beside him. I didn't do business with him outside of us just showing on a radio show together. But a lot of people took that I was in business with him. Make a long story short, we ended up in court. I had to, I had to prove evidence that I had nothing to do with his business. That I, show my, I had to even show my bank accounts. I, I was on stand, like I was feeling like law and order, uh, answering uh, uh, um, uh, questions from a pit bull of an attorney. And I showed him exactly what my bank accounts looked like. I showed him that I did not take any money from this guy's business. 
I was actually uh, exonerated of this uh, situation. But the whole experience, I mean, I had spent $20,000 of my own money for counsel to prove that I'm innocent. And I could have avoided all this by doing what? Seeking counsel first. If I was really waging war to expand my business, to grow and promote, I should have sought wise counsel. I, I need to make sure people are vetted out before I jumped. I was just so eager to have that first or second move. I wasn't looking at the third, fourth, fifth move or potentially the collateral damage that might happen to me by associating with this type of person. I was trying to give them a pass. I said, all oh, people, uh, people, uh, people can change. Well, sometimes if they're not in the faith, if not walk around with the right people in their ear, they may not change. And the resulting instance is that it hurts myself. And it's twenty thousand dollars I could have put towards my kids. It's twenty thousand dollars I could put their college education. I wasted that time. And by the way, it was only six months. I didn't make anything from that campaign. It actually cost me twenty thousand dollars and worse, the time and a heartache, and the fact that I had to look over my shoulder when it came to my association with this type of person. Make a long story short, years passed, but I had to deal with that. Again, it could have all been avoided by seeking counsel. So therefore, if you are looking to partner with somebody and looking to do a campaign with somebody, please consider this video and please consider what the scripture is sharing with you and seek counsel and have a spirit of discernment across your decisions. With that being said, here's some points here who not to partner with. Who not to partner with. If you want to partner with somebody, they're opposite of this, all right? So here's who not to partner with. Number one, somebody that shows lack of integrity. Let's go to Proverbs 29, verse 24. It reads like this. Whoever is a partner with a thief hates his own life. He swears to tell the truth, but reveals nothing. So guys, if, if you're thinking about getting involved in business with a thief, uh, somebody that has stolen, somebody that cheats on application, somebody tries to rush things, hey man, let's just do this and, and we'll fix it the next time, that's a thief. You know, oftentimes I, 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 I'd say, you know, I just let this person have a pass, I forgive them. Yes, no problem, you forgive them, but that doesn't mean you go in business with them because he who partners with a thief hates his own life. Because you have to think to yourself, would I do that? Well, my partner is, so why do I put it up with it? Number two, somebody not to partner with. Somebody that has high amount of anger and temper. Now, I say this tongue-in-cheek because growing up, I was a very angry boy. I say this tongue-in-cheek because the military did nothing but hone that anger into its, its own weapon. But when I left the military, I was no longer that person. And when I came into the faith, I was no longer that person. I was baptized. I'm a new man. I'm a new creation. But that doesn't mean I didn't have residual. That doesn't mean I was still dealing with th certain things. That doesn't mean that the PTSD with inside me still had not completely washed away. I still had to have those knee-jerk reactions removed from me by creating new habits to make sure that I, I, would, I didn't have the amount of anger and temper I had when first leaving the military. However, when you partner with somebody like that, you have to ask, okay, well, is this person quick to temper? Listen, we had an incident one time. We had an after party and tempers were flaring, right? And we had a moment right there, I said, listen, do we get into this as a fight? Really? We're grown men? Are we really getting into a fight? Or are we going to be better about this? I said, listen, let's not let tempers flare. Let's think about the overall picture about what's about to happen or poten potential distractions are going to happen to having to answer to this type of situation. Do we want that really in our life? Do we want our business and our family name to be branded with this type of situation? The answer is no. So I'm not buying into my anger. I'm not buying into my temper. I don't have to be right. This person wants to come across us, the person wants to disrespect us, I got it, but I'm not getting baited into a fight. We're grown people, we're mature people, we can sense and reason out. I don't need to win every situation. I think back when I was younger, I need to win every situation. I need to be right, I need to be right, but I think age and potentially wisdom, whatever you call it, has said, you know, I don't want to be quick to temper, I want to be quick to anger, and if somebody that you're partnering with is quick to those type of disruptive behaviors, not, not that you don't show them love, not that you don't call them a friend, but you just may not want to partner with them. Number three, avoid the fool. <laughs> Again, a fool is somebody who is unwise, not using wisdom to make decisions. Somebody who is imprudent, and a person who's imprudent doesn't care about what they say, what they do. They don't care about their actions. You know the whole saying, I don't care about what you say, I care more about what you do. Well, a fool doesn't care about his actions. He doesn't realize that something may be remembered a year later, six months later, two years later. You want that type of person that's imprudent. Think about what's going on right now. Think about what's going on in our country. How much acts of foolishness is happening right now that's dividing our country. And yet we need God's people to come together and say, hey, this is how we unify. This is how we unite. This is how we forgive. You know, I, I'm, I'm so sad that, on a quick side note here, I'm so sad that so many people have disagreements that they can't find a way to debate topics and find out ways to work together. Instead, they got to be canceling each other. That's not God's way. 
but I wouldn't go in business with that person. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust this. I wouldn't trust a fool with our paycheck. I wouldn't trust a fool with uh, the company bank accounts. You want to trust them with making business decisions on your behalf. So be careful about thinking about parting with the fool. Because it says in scripture, Proverbs 14, chapter 7, it reads like this. Stay away from a foolish man, for you will not find knowledge on his lips. So when you're building a business and you're going where you've never gone before, you go saying, I've never made a million dollars before. Shoot, I've never made $100,000 before. I, made, I never made $500,000 before. Do you want wisdom on their lips or do you want foolishness? On their lips. Well, if you pick foolishness, you'll never get to become a first generation cash flow millionaire in the minimum amount of time frame. So avoid going in partnership with fools. Again, I didn't say judge them. I didn't say not to forgive them. I said just not to partner with them. Number four, flattery. Oh, this is a big one. Lots of times people love to use flattery, which is defined here in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 5. It reads like this Whoever flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his feet. Now keep in mind, there's a difference between praise and flattery. Praise is about commending your behavior. Flattery is kind of, it's like more like smooth talk. They're just trying to stroke your ego. So again, understand the difference of using flattery as smooth talk versus genuine praise. Now, with that being said, when people in, in, our, in, our, in our world of edification, when people try to edify you and they try to say, you're this, you're that, I'm very careful who we take praise and recognition from. I'm very careful who I take flattery from. Wife, no problem. Uh, certain counselors, yes. But in the general public, there's only very few people that are used to use flattery or praise because I don't need, the last thing I need in my life is to be flattered just to be smooth talk with the wrong people. Last but not least, gossip. You gotta avoid the gossipers. Man, let's look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19. It reads like this. A gossip betrays a confidence. So avoid a man who talks too much. I remember one time uh, a, a person in our industry, they're saying, hey, I want you to do business with us. Why should we do business with you? Because we do this, 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 awesome, very cool. And she goes, oh, by the way, your you're, you're, you're other competitor, they use us too as well. But you know what? Here, here's what I don't like about them. They do this, they do this, they do this, but yet they use us. I say, say that one more time. Yeah, we like them, but they do this, they do this, they do this, wrong. Hold up, you want me to do business with you? But you're throwing this other competitor, I mean, I'm glad you... <laughs> You're sharing this with me right now, but I don't even feel comfortable with you talking about my competitor in such a way because I realize that it's only a matter of time before they start talking about us because any person that does business for any extended period of time, there's bound to have conflict. I mean, anytime you have a relationship with somebody, partner, business, relationship in life, you're bound to have conflict. And how does that person talk about you in moments of conflict to other people? It may or may not be favorable if they're talking gossip about you to somebody else, or somebody's talking about gossip with somebody else to you, uh, uh, time out. I don't even want to have this conversation with you. Hey, listen, you're a nice person. Uh, I, I, I appreciate uh, your desire to want to come and do business with us and partner with us, uh, but no thanks. These are the type of people I avoid. When I hear gossip about other people, I automatically shut that stuff down. You know why? Because I already feel bad for the other person receiving this, talking behind their back. I feel about it. It's called backbiting and backstabbing. I don't like that type of conversation. If you don't have nothing, with back. Back to the golden rule, if you've got nothing nice to say to people, why do you think you can throw somebody under the bus in my presence? And by the way, just know this, just know this. Negative people love talking to other negative people. So if somebody's talking negative about somebody with you, what does that say about you? The opposite is true. Positive people love talking to other positive people. If they're saying positive things to one another, edifying, lifting, encouraging each other up, well, amen to that. But avoid the people who are negative. By the way, I've always said this. The people that are most dangerous in life are the most negative, lazy, and but most ambitious people. They're most ambitious, but they don't accomplish anything. And in return, guess what? They blame everybody else. It's a toxic behavior. Those folks are the best gossipers. So avoid, if you want to partner with somebody, avoid somebody who has a tendency, is already showing you the tendencies to be a gossiper. So with that being said, guys, I'd love to know your thoughts. What are your thoughts? What's your feedbacks? on what King Solomon is writing through the book of Proverbs, how are you receiving it? How are you receiving it based on the people that you found yourself with, the fact that uh, you need to surround yourself with well, wise counsel, not just being in, me, myself, and I being in isolation, being behind a computer trying to figure this out by yourself. Listen, there's a reason why we need community. There's a reason why you need to seek advisors. There's a reason why there's counselors necessary to help build you up to the next level. It's very difficult to go about life, me, myself, and I, I'm going to do it by myself. What are your thoughts about that? 
You have any questions? Put it in the comment section below. You have any feedback to it? Put it in the comment section below. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. I hope here at the beginning of this new year, you're starting to lock and to evaluate the people that's going to be a blessing in your life, or sadly, are the people that are going to take away those blessings in your life. Because the last thing I want you to do is not be where you want to be this time next year. So that being said, guys, as I wrap up, check out this video here with my mentor, my counselor, my advisor, Patrick Bet David, on the five mindset hacks for you to become a first generation cash for millionaire. Check this video out. And also, if you didn't watch out the first video on how the Bible made me a millionaire, check out the first book I talk about as it pertains to my favorite, favorite Bible story to help me make millions. Why? Because I want to be a blessing not only to my family, I want to create a, a, a generational wealth to pass on a financial legacy and a legacy to my family that my last name is going to be remembered forever, but also be a blessing to other people so we can pay it forward, so we can be a blessing in other people's lives to us. It's not to embellish and, and, and just to say, hey, I got this, I got that. Hey, it's to enjoy the creation and the blessings and the abundance that God gives us here on this earth. So with that being said, guys, I hope you took away a couple things. If not, let me know below. If you have, put, again, put them in the comment section below. If you've taken some nuggets away, please, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, please click subscribe, hit notifications, be alerted next time we upload our next episode. With that being said, guys, I'm your Money Smart Guy, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys.